Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, joined today by Michael Chasen, who is the co-founder and CEO of Class. He also was the co-founder and CEO of Blackboard back in the day. Rather than me tell you about Michael, we're going to hear from him himself. Michael, welcome to Trending in Education. Michael, thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast today. You have quite a history. So like I said, I'm going to let you spin that yarn. Can you catch us up on how you got to this point in your professional life? Sure. Blackboard is very much the quintessential startup story. Literally myself and my roommate from college, Matthew Batinsky, uh, got a brownstone in downtown Washington, D.C., and uh, we started Blackboard. Now, just before that, we were both working at KPMG Pete Marwick back when they were one of the big accounting and consulting firms. And we saw that universities who were our clients were spending millions of dollars wiring the dorm room and the classroom to the internet, but they weren't spending any money on software to make that useful for teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So we decided to quit our jobs, which we had been at for just about a year. We rented a brownstone in downtown Washington, D.C., and we started Blackboard, with the idea of developing software that would let institutions put their courses online. Uh, very early on, there was actually a group of students at a Cornell University that had already developed some tools that teachers at Cornell and a few other institutions were using. So we ended up merging with them. And then together, we brought to market the very first real LMS, Blackboard Learn. A learning management system, for those of you who don't know the initials, when you think LMS, you think Blackboard, and you kind of invented the category. Yeah, we were really one of the first people to think about how the internet might be useful for bringing education online. You know, it was so interesting because I remember back then, so we started the company, we had about a handful of employees, many of them just our friends who were working for free. We were working all day long, often even sleeping in the offices. And we were talking to some early venture capital investors about potentially raising some money. And, you know, this was kind of before the big dot-com boom. So we weren't familiar with the idea of raising capital or anything like that. And we're speaking with the a venture capital firm, a small local one. And they said, hey, we, we called a bunch of schools and asked them if they'd be interested in a learning management system. We said, oh, that's great. Well, what did the school say? They all said they'd never use it. They said teachers are Luddites. They won't know how to use the technology. Students aren't asking for it. And by the way, it might be illegal to put grades online. Wow. So that was the early feedback. But nonetheless, we, of course, knew that, no, the internet was changing everything. And it was certainly going to have, I actually thought, a disproportional effect on education. Yeah. I mean, if you could start delivering education online, then you could really end up bringing down the cost and increasing the access. And we really imagined our platform being used in two ways. One, to complement existing classes. So you still go to class twice a week, but you download your homework online. You may even take a test or a quiz online. You communicate with your fellow students and teachers online. Mm -hmm. There'd be a whole online component in addition to your traditional class. Right. And then for institutions that wanted to do full-blown distance learning, have a take a class online or a program or get a full degree online, they would also need to use our technology. Right. And the company ended up growing from there. We started with just a handful of employees in a browser in downtown DC. We ended up growing to the 3,000 employees with 20 offices around the world. We expanded beyond just putting your courses online, but we went to start to enable institutions to use the internet for all different parts of their education processes and yeah. ended up growing the company. I got to take the company public. I ended up, I was actually one of the youngest CEOs on the NASDAQ before Mark Zuckerberg and everybody went public. And also now I'm older and no one cares about me anymore, but I used to be younger years ago. I got to grow the company, ran it as a public company for seven years before selling it to Providence Equity Partners for uh, just under 1.8 billion. Yeah, amazing. And, uh, it was a, it was an incredible ride, and I got to spend almost twenty years in the ed tech space, uh, an industry that I think is vitally important, and also one I'm very passionate about. Yeah, it's an amazing story, and it is. You mentioned ed tech there. In some ways, Blackboard is kind of one of the definitional platforms, and you know, founder story, success story of the early stages of ed tech. You've stayed in the space in different capacities, but then really threw your hat back in the ring again as a co-founder and CEO with Class. Can you catch us up on that part of your story? Sure. So I I found myself home during the pandemic, just as we all did. And I had three children at the time. My, my daughter was in third grade, my, my son in high school, my older daughter in college. And they all now found themselves home taking their classes online on Zoom. But I saw that they were having challenges really engaging with their online classes. And when I asked their teachers, why are you having such a hard time getting these students engaged in the online class? They said, look, Zoom and Microsoft Teams and these other virtual meeting tools, they're great for lectures and they're great for group discussion. But a lot of what we do in the physical classroom, you just can't replicate online. And we do yes. a lot. 
We take attendance, we hand out assignments, we give tests or quizzes, we proctor exams, we talk one-on-one -on -one with the students who might have group presentation. We might use a textbook or electronic content or watch internet or watch videos or track student progress and read ups and all of those things make up an engaging class experience. And we can do all that in the physical classroom, but you just can't replicate it online. Right. And uh, well, you know, as I mentioned, I have 17 years in running Blackboard and my undergraduate degree is actually in computer science. So I know a lot about technology. And I got together with a bunch of developers that I'd worked with previously at Blackboard and other companies that were experts in building e-learning tools. We knew that Zoom had an open software development kit. Eric is a very technology forward thinker. Eric Wan, yep. And when he came out with Zoom, he really wanted it to be more than just a communications tool, but a platform. And you know, that other people could build on top of, even though not a lot of people were, because Zoom wasn't yet the industry standard. But because of COVID, Zoom became almost this industry standard, even more so in, in education. Yeah. Where almost all classes were online on Zoom. Yeah. And so we took that. And we utilize that to build on top of it. You know, if you had asked me what the future of e-learning looked like years ago, I would have said the future of e-learning is very much asynchronous. People were going to use LMSs like Blackboard or Canvas or Moodle or Desire to Learn and yeah. it'd be self-paced learning. And a teacher would pop in once a week just to make sure things were moving along. Because mm -hmm. you could possibly put an entire class or institution online in a live learning, live audio, video, full-time scenario. It just wouldn't scale. And then during COVID, we did it. We put right. Hundreds of thousands of teachers and millions of students, we put every institution in the world online at the same time in the way that students want to learn in live, live learning scenarios. Yeah. And we did. The technology was there. Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Google, their technology infrastructure and the internet bandwidth had reached a point where you could have this type of an interaction. Right. And that's 80% of it. But what do we do? We put everybody online in virtual meeting rooms. Right. So the idea of class is to take that last mile and change the virtual meeting room to a virtual classroom. Mm -hmm. That last step. So really, the majority of the movement that's been made in e-learning is the fact that we have the bandwidth to do it. Right. Class just takes that final step and says, hey, instead of this virtual meeting interface that you use when you're at Zoom or Microsoft Teams, let's make it a virtual classroom. Yeah. We the back end of Zoom, the most scalable audio video back end system in the world, but we put the students in an online classroom instead of just an online meeting room. And it makes yeah. all the difference in the world. We see engagement go through the roof. We see students being able to actively participate in a class in a way that they weren't before. We see teachers finally have all of the resources that they had in the physical classroom they can now use online. Yeah, it's impressive to think about building for those user types who frequently get forgotten. The live online instructor, the person who has to push and orchestrate the different components of their class. A lot of those live online classes are also chat-based. And, you know, we made it this far. We just talked about the pandemic, but now it's time to talk about the other major transformational shift that's happening, which is the advent of generative artificial intelligence. You've been leaning into that trend as well. I'd love to dig in more on the other elements of class, but you now have an AI teaching assistant that's being integrated into your program. I'm a big fan of that. I actually have a virtual co-host, Nancy, who couldn't be here today, but she does send her best. Can you describe a little about what went into that thinking, your thoughts on the generative AI wave and how class is tapping into it? So look, I, I think AI obviously is going to cause a revolution in every industry, but I actually think in an outsized way in education and really from two aspects. One, look, not actually every teacher has a teaching assistant and in some classes are quite large. So we could actually use an AI, have a teacher and assist them in running the class with the students. That is a giant win. In addition, using an AI to analyze the data and to track student progress and then be able to come up with more customized learning plans for students or to be able to better identify at-risk students. So I think AI has both a front end and a back end is going to have outsized effects in both the front end and the back end in education. Now, what we decided to tackle first was we wanted to start utilizing AI in our product in a way where the teachers as well as the students would benefit without even having to know anything about AI. So we created an AI teaching assistant. What it does is in our class, we automatically feed the transcript of the class as it happens, everything the teacher and the students say, as well as all the materials presented, and we send that into the AI. Then the students during class, if they have a question, they don't have necessarily need to raise their hand and interrupt the teacher. They can literally ask the AI teaching assistant. So let's say that the teacher was teaching a class in science and talk about photosynthesis and the student doesn't understand. Instead of interrupting the whole class, if it's a very basic question, they can ask the AI, hey, AI teaching assistant, can you explain photosynthesis to me? This is through, this is through chat. Yes, through just a, through a chat. And then 
it'll analyze first the data that was has been presented to the class to be able to answer, but then also it's expanded knowledge base. Yeah. And let's say the student doesn't understand that. The student can say, can you explain it to me a different way? And the AI can then even re-explain it in a different way. Now, not only that, we actually wanted to use the AI to try to do a few things that maybe weren't possible before. So besides providing the ability to answer questions, even as the students are viewing the transcript, they can even highlight something the teacher said and say, explain this to me in a different way, AI teaching assistant. And the AI will take that and then explain it in a different way to maybe help the student better understand that. Mm -hmm. And then we did a few things like um, the AI will notice if you're late for class. And so it'll say, hey, I noticed you were 10 minutes late for class. Do you want me to summarize what you missed? And wow. it'll actually summarize the first 10 minutes of class for you. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the class, the AI writes a summary of the class and is putting together study guides for all the students in the class as well, all automatically. So these are all things that we can automate to make the AI a useful tool. It helps the teacher. Maybe now they're offloading some of the basic questions that the students have. Another way to look at the material, you're not pausing the whole class to answer them. And we're providing, we're building out tools like a class summary and study guide. And this is just our step one. This is just kind of our toe in the water. How can people start to use the AI in, in class? And I think we came up with a pretty good first implementation that is useful to the faculty and to the students. That's very cool. It reminds me also of something we used to call pseudo sync, which is make it feel like it's live by virtue of having access to live help in real time. So you could actually do that with a recording, I imagine, too. The same kind of technology would make it feel more. That's exactly. Yes. And that's yeah. exactly what we're looking to do. So we are coming out with something called interactive recordings. So normally when you record an online class, it just saves as an MP4 or an audio file and you can listen to it, but you really right. lose a lot of the interactivity or learning activities that, that the teacher's doing during class. Yeah. So we built a special recording format that if five minutes into the class, uh, the teacher shares the syllabus, five minutes into the recording playback, the syllabus launches on your screen. Mm -hmm. And if 10 minutes into the class, the teacher launches a test, then 10 yeah. minutes into the recording playback, the actual test launches. And yeah. as long as it's still available for you to take it, the teacher says, hey, you can take this test within 24 hours. You can watch the interactive playback. Get to that point, the test launches, you could go ahead and take the test. That's cool. Then what our plan is to, now the only difference is you really can't tell that you're in a class recording. It seems like you're in the live class. The only thing you can't do is ask the teacher questions. Right. But now with your AI, yeah, you can't ask the teacher questions, but you can ask the AI it's, teaching us. Exactly, exactly. Which is pretty cool, especially because I think we all still embrace the power of live, but schedules are complicated, lives are complicated. So the idea that you can still have almost as good an experience as live when you're playing catch up makes a ton of sense. You mentioned this stuff is new. It's fresh, fresh out the gate. It's got a long horizon on it. And I'd love to hear some of your maybe further reaching thoughts as well. The other area I'd love to hear more about is new kinds of synchronous environments, VR, AR, new, more immersive experiences for the real time. What's next? You're someone who's had a nice track record of getting a read on things early and then hopping in at the right time. What's out there that's got you excited? I don't think people realize the effect that COVID has had on education. Because of course now we're all like, look, we're back in person. We're trying our best to just get back to normal, get the classes going. But you can't put hundreds of thousands of faculty and millions of students online and not expect there to be a dramatic change. Let me explain in more detail. I, I give the analogy to online food ordering. I was trying to explain to my kids the other day that when I was younger, the only food we could order was pizza and Chinese food to be delivered to your house. And my kids were like, why those two very different mm. genres of food? Why pizza yeah. and Chinese food and nothing else? Because now, of course, my kids expect that every restaurant yes. delivers. Yes. From Starbucks that we literally had Benny Hanna's the other night for, you know, the hibachi place. They will pack it up and deliver it through Uber Eats to your house. Unbelievable. Oh. Right. And that's what they expect any restaurant they can get delivered food from. So similarly, they spent over a year in their classes online. Yeah. My children, they are indifferent to whether they take it in person class or an online class. And in fact, they figure that some of their classes when they go to college will be online and some will be in person and some will be a hybrid or a kind of a mixed class. And it really will depend on the class that they're taking and the timing of the class and what's available when they need it. But they don't, they don't see online classes as a second form of education. They see it equal to the first. They know they can get a great education with online classes. So when you ask what's happening, look, we put in on that, we trained every teacher in the world in online learning, giving them a crash course. They literally sure. suddenly had to do it. 
Yeah. So now you have all these people trained in online learning. You have all these students that now think of online learning equal to in-person learning. So of course, this is going to have dramatic effects long term. And I think that the synchronous learning space, the live learning space, is going to have the most innovation and the most forward momentum because this is the way the students want to learn. So you're going to see a lot more people taking online classes, and you're going to see a lot more of those classes being live synchronous. Yeah. And the thing that I'm the most excited about, though, is look, if you had asked me when I was running Blackboard, you know, what's kind of one of the effects of online learning, one of the things I had hoped was that it would really be able to lower the cost and increase access to education. Yeah. And I think that it had some effect on that, but really not enough because the truth is that in LMS and self-paced learning, that isn't the way, that is the preferred way that students want to learn. This right. is life. Right. But now you can put an entire institution, every class online, on Zoom from Microsoft Teams, and it works and it scales. And that means that you can deliver education the way the students want, even when they're at home. Mm -hmm. And now I think truly for the first time, you're going to be able to increase access and lower the cost of education. And I think you're going to see new business models, cheaper colleges, and more access to education in a way that we haven't before. And that's why I'm so excited to still be in this space and excited about what we're doing at class. It's also striking to me around the full life cycle of education. I have a four-year-old going from as as early as when you're first exposed to pre-K and any sort of formal instruction, right through K-12, higher ed, and then throughout your life, folks are going to need to upskill more. The skills disruption is happening a lot faster. It's a second hat you wear as a leader of an organization. How do I keep my employees trained and upskilled? As someone who has a window into all that, because class kind of touches all those use cases, how are you thinking about lifelong learning? How are you thinking about the disruption of skills? And then what kind of role do you think synchronous learning can play in all that? Well, well again, I think synchronous learning is playing a key role because, again, the way people learn best is through live learning. And it's always harder. If you said, okay, look, you're going to do some upskilling. I want you to take this self-paced course on your own. Yeah. Again, that's self-paced learning works for some people, but not the vast majority. The vast majority want an instructor, want it live, but it was hard to scale that. Right, uh, And the technology wasn't there to have it from home, but now you can. So I think it's going to change everything. And I'm very excited about that. And yes, at the same time with the advent of AI, clearly, and just as a general population, we need to make sure that we are continuing to educate our peers, the population to be able to go after these new jobs that are going to be created either from AI or jobs replaced because of AI, that we need to make sure that we have a skilled workforce. And not everyone can drive in to go to school every day. So having online learning on the computers, which I mean, just about everybody now has a computer, you know, I think that is the way that you handle not only individual problems, but society problems as well. And then you touched on the importance of teachers and maybe extending that into what we're talking about. Just makers, there are new marketplaces emerging, for example, for prompt engineers, you know, people who, you know, from November until now, it's maybe six months. They've been banging away at ChatGPT, and now suddenly they're making courses because there's this tremendous need. It does feel like the barrier to entry of, for online learning is lower on both sides, both on the instructor side and also on the learner side. Any thoughts there? I would say it's definitely lower on the learner side. For the instructor side, while I think it's lower, I think more so that we now can elevate the level of the classes we actually have online with tools like class. This is why I'm so excited about it. Again, you can do more than just have this back and forth. You literally can say, I'm going to give everyone a lecture. Then we're going to go into breakout groups. Each breakout mm. group is going to do different work and assignments. Then you're going to show that work back to the class. Yeah. Come back, I'm going to give you a quiz. I'm going to prompt for that quiz. All that data is tracked. And then do an analysis and says, hey, what was the engagement of the students like? How they get on the exam? And what was the correlation between those things? Right. So I think both the added bandwidth, the fact that you can have these live synchronous classes, and now the incorporation of AI means that education onto itself is going to go through more change in the next two to three years than it has in the last 10. That's nice. A that was a thing. You just put something out there. So we're expecting some really accelerated innovation cycles within education and ed tech. And then you also probably need a critical mass to go through those cycles fast enough because you want to be learning and iterating on them. So I imagine that's the other element is that class is bringing scale to the virtual learning environment. So you can build that feedback loop with the data you're generating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So I have Michael Chase in here with me. He's the co-founder and CEO of Class, also the former co-founder. So I guess you're still the co-founder of Blackboard. If you found the company, you're always Yeah, that, that's right. But now no form, the CEO. former CEO. And then, you know, I know you've also been involved in the ed tech sector and just thinking about the future. You've been an investor and wearing a bunch of different hats in the interim. Outside of what we talked about so far with Class, 
Anything else you think our listeners, folks who care about the future of learning, future of work, future of education, anything out there that's resonating with you that you think our learners should be paying attention to? Well, look, as I said, I think the three big trends are the availability of the bandwidth and the pipes to do the live streaming audio video that occurred during COVID, Mm -hmm. combined with now the ability to actually replicate that physical classroom experience online with class, and then the additive, the ability for AI technology to be incorporated in the learning environment, whether it's at a teaching assistant, whether it's at a tutor, whether it's used to analyze data on the back end to identify at-risk students or situations or put together the best type of content or syllabus. I think as those three things come together, you are going to see an acceleration in education at all levels. And that is what I think is, is so excited. And I think that acceleration at the end of the day will cause there to be less friction, more opportunity, increased access. And at the end of the day, we really will be able to deliver a higher level education at a lower cost, which means we can reach more people. Realizing the promise you identified early in your career, we're catching up. The world is catching up, Michael. Finally, 20 years later. It's been amazing having you on the show. Michael Chasen is the co-founder and CEO of Class. You can check out what they have going on at class.com. Also the co-founder and former CEO of Blackboard. Lots of amazing ideas put out today. Michael, thanks so much for joining me on today's show. Michael, it was a pleasure. Thanks. I'm happy to come back anytime. Awesome. And for our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please write us a review, subscribe, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.